For me, it's always been about that witch. Yes, there's much more spectacle to be found in other elements in Stan Winston's pumpkin head, like the title creature, who we'll get to in just a little bit, but that haggard old witch who sets the nightmare in motion has always been the scariest element of the film for this writer. I recall watching the movie at the perhaps too young age of nine or 10 and being riveted by the movie's spooky atmosphere and impressive special effects. But that witch scared the hell out of me with her gravelly voice, ghastly visage, and haunting laugh. One of the truly scary ideas in the film is that you might just stumble upon a shed in the woods if you went in deep enough. And within, you might just meet someone like that frightening figure who seems to know everything about you. Like a creepy figure from an old fable or nursery rhyme, the witch can grant your darkest wishes, but be careful what you wish for. Because, well, we all know how that ends. But just in case you don't, we're gonna invite you deep into the backwoods to discover one of the best horror movies you never saw, Pumpkinhead. Like a grim fairy tale tinged with elements of a slasher movie, Pumpkinhead thrusts you into an unfamiliar world where modern civilization is nowhere to be seen, and dark magic exists to bring your worst nightmares to life. Despite some recognizable machinery, this movie seems to take place out of time, where even such reliable conveniences as telephones aren't welcome. The woods and the hills that's all there is for most of the folks who live wherever this is. One strength of the film is that it doesn't feel the need to explain away everything. The where's and when's don't matter. If an idea is scary enough, the story will work. And this movie has a scary idea and some very scary things to show you. As with most horror films, Pumpkinhead needs to set the tone with its opening scene. You'll fail and you'll die. Been on that. Been on that. We see a paltry little house in the middle of a foreboding forest. Inside, the glow emitting from the fireplace can't warm the spirits of a concerned family who look like they're in the midst of mourning someone. And in a way, they are. It's their neighbor who runs screaming to their front door, begging for help. But the patriarch knows the truth. He can offer no help. He can only protect his own and stay out of the nasty business that has come to take outside. For their neighbor has a debt to pay and something has come to collect, something monstrous, something completely unswayed by the man's desperate cries and screams. A young boy sees what he's not supposed to. Their neighbor has come face to face with pretty much the last thing you'd wanna see before your time on earth is up. The boy becomes a man, Ed Harley lives a very simple existence with a boy of his own. He's got his own general store that services, well, however many people live out there in the mountains. These people most likely aren't used to seeing many outsiders, but they do get some, unfortunately, for all involved. You know, in movies like these, that when the city folks arrive, trouble arrives right behind them. And our group of newcomers are a bit of a noisy bunch. Not rude, perhaps, but certainly out of their element and not afraid to make their mark on the place. A couple of them are dirt bikers, adding unwelcome sounds to the serene landscape. They're about to leave their mark in another way, and that will change and ruin the lives of everyone in an instant. Yeah, the city folks should have stayed in the city this time. So it goes that Ed Harley has only one thing on his mind after losing everything, revenge. Most reasonable people will tell you that an eye for an eye makes the whole world go blind. But try telling that to a man who lost his son, to a thoughtless jerk who could have avoided tragedy if he weren't so careless. So Ed Harley seeks out the witch. Her name is Haggis, and he asks for something he knows full well he shouldn't. The witch is going to summon an angel of vengeance to go after the city folk, although demon of vengeance is much more accurate. Pumpkinhead is its name, and once you call upon it, there's no turning back. 
even when you inevitably come to regret it. This is simple campfire story stuff, made all the more rich because the filmmakers know exactly what kind of movie they want to deliver. Take away the dirt bikes and the cars, and the film could take place a hundred years prior, as the essential elements of the tale are timeless. It's not very surprising that the film is based on a poem, though it could just as easily have been based on a myth or legend based down through the generations. In the world established early on in the film, we believe monsters and witches are real, and they're not easy to forget. Pumpkinhead marked the directorial debut of the Oscar-winning makeup designer Stan Winston, who was looking to try his hand at the art form after bringing the impossible to life on films like The Terminator, Aliens, and Predator. The story goes that the film's producers sent Winston the script in the hope he'd agree to create the monster at the center of the action. But Winston saw an opportunity to finally direct his own picture. He agreed to design and build the character, but only if he could direct his creation as well. And Winston proves with Pumpkinhead that he had the chops to effectively deliver a horror story to the big screen. It's not all special effects and blood and guts as you might expect. Though of course, all those goodies are in abundance once things get going. Winston knows that half the battle is creating atmosphere and along with talented director of photography, Bohan Bozelli, he conjures a very ominous world made up of shadows, moonlight, and lighting. The forest in the film would be a scary place to wander even without the towering pumpkin head lurking within, but when he does show up, he brings a real show with him. Flashes of light, unnerving sounds, a whirlwind of leaves and debris. What the monster lacks in subtlety, he more than makes up for with showmanship. As can be expected, he's an impressive creation. Winston apparently left most of the designing to his protégés while he worked on preparing for his debut. And what the guys came up with can now be considered a classic in the genre. Though his size is certainly intimidating, Pumpkinhead's withered, sneering face is one of the scariest things about him. It definitely resembles what a demon straight out of hell might look like. And the way he seems to enjoy carrying out his punishment is even scarier. Some crafty direction on Winston's part makes it so we buy Pumpkinhead's range of motion. And while he doesn't always necessarily look like he's walking and stalking on his own without the help of some Hollywood magic, he's always impressive to behold. I'm sure most of us will take a practical effect like Pumpkinhead over a CGI creation any day of the week. As for his human co-stars, we get just enough personality and backstory to keep us involved in their plight. The horror of the situation in the second half of the film is elevated because we know that Pumpkinhead's targets aren't really bad people. Well, all right, Joel, the one who got them into this mess, is a major league son of a bitch, but the others seem just fine. As far as the performances go, they're natural and perfectly acceptable, with John DeQuino a standout as the aforementioned Bad Apple. We don't get to know the characters very well because this is predominantly Ed Harley's story but from what we can gather, they're ordinary people thrust into a very unfortunate situation by one bad apple. But sometimes you're in the wrong place at the wrong time and you get a hideous demon sicked on you. Aside from Pumpkinhead himself, the star of the show is Lance Henriksen, finally getting his chance to be the main character after years of playing supporting roles. He's quite perfectly cast as Ed Harley, who wears years of hard work and hardship on his face. The early scenes between Ed and his son truly set a bittersweet mood, and Henriksen is up to the challenge of making Ed a believably serious yet compassionate father. Once things take a turn for the worse, Lance barely needs any words to express his pain and rage. That unforgettable mug of his says it all. The film also cleverly makes it so that Pumpkinhead even slightly resembles Ed, and vice versa, for their link until the end by an unholy bond. Lance would continue to make a living playing quiet men haunted by inner demons, perhaps most memorably in the underrated Fox series Millennium. But Pumpkinhead still might be his most satisfying performance to date. It's a shame Winston only directed one feature after this, the forgettable family flick A Gnome Named Norm, because he showed true promise with Pumpkinhead. Naturally, he would be very busy in the 90s with all sorts of phenomenal work, 
notably Terminator 2 and Jurassic Park, for which he won Oscars. So it's not like we were denied his talents. Still, he proved that he was more than a one-trick pony on his directorial debut. And if he hadn't been so darn great at helping other people bring their visions to life, he might have sat in the director's chair a few more times and showed us more fantastical sights. The great man passed away at the too young age of 62 in 2005, a true loss for the movie industry as well as all who knew and admired him. If you love watching his handiwork in the movies of Spielberg and Cameron, you should do yourself a favor and watch or rewatch one of his most frightening creations, Pumpkinhead.